this lecture. The first half will be sort of a uh, conceptual exploration. I'll talk about what microtonal music is, why it's important, some common misconceptions. We'll take a small break. And then at the second half, we will talk about more of the music theory and the mathematical Alrighty, so to begin, we have some music for you to listen to, uh, to hear what it sounds like. So it's kind of if you would play the first one, I'll put it to you and you need to stop. is the 
the way it is. You have white keys on the bottom here, and these white keys represent a major scale, and then these other black keys represent deviations from that major scale. And back when people were creating pianos, it was a bit more of an issue to figure out where the black keys went, and how many keys there needed to be, and how to get everything in tune. But that is a story for later. For now, you have heard the chromatic scale, the major scale, and then a diatonic progression uh, known as one, four, five, one in today's music theory. So, about the unhelpfulness of the word microtonality. We already talked about the fact that microtonal music has to have a standard. So if there's a 12-note piano, then microtonality is anything that's outside the piano. But we might not get very precise with that either. I mean, it might actually just refer to differences in and differences in regional tunings. Uh, for example, uh, a gamelan player who tunes in like five tone, maybe our music is microtonal to him. There's sort of this assumption we have to make about what's regularly used. Uh, like with anything, uh, if you have a language that's created, people will only choose certain sounds from it uh, to create their language. It's similar in the world of music. We only use a limited part of the pitch spectrum. Now, there's also a confusion with the actual word microtonality. It implies something small. Uh, but microtonal, if it refers to anything that's not 12 tone equal temperament, which is, again, the piano, then it can be something that has steps that are larger than 12 tone equal temperament, like 11 tone equal temperament, 10 tone, anything smaller, or just any other kinds of groups of notes that have steps that are larger. And if you know your music theory, equal temperament just divides an octave equally. So if you have C and then C, like we saw there, uh, you could insert any number of notes in between. And if all the notes sound equally far apart, uh, when you get from one octave to the next, then it's an equal division of the octave. Uh, so I will sort of use the terms microtonality and zenharmonic interchangeably in this presentation. Uh, but know that they basically mean the same thing. Oh, and one more thing. Does diatonic music count? This one is fun. Because a lot of people don't know that our tuning system, the piano, is actually out of tune with just intonation, then there's another confusion that happens when we try and look at diatonic music. Because the West has always been about diatonic music and trying to figure out how to tune it you know, sort of optimally in the best way. So singers, uh, for example, in choir, when they don't have the piano, will naturally lock in their major chords and tune to just intonation. But I wouldn't know if this would be considered microtonal. It's certainly off from the piano, but it still gets across the intention that the music wants, the diatonicism and the diatonic harmony. So for some people, microtonal music that's just intonation wouldn't count if microtonal implies a non-diatonic framework. But historically, a lot of microtonal music has been used to try and figure out the solution to how do we best play diatonic music in tune? All right, so why consider microtonality? Well, there are a few reasons I talked about previously, and then we'll also go over some other ones. Well, let's see. First off, there's uh, a knowledge of constants and dissonance that is gained from learning about music theory. Uh, we don't really study the mathematics of pitch at all, and I think there's, uh, I don't know, there's an assumption that it's an intimidating world and that it's very hard to study. But actually, uh, a lot of the things that we do with pitch are just adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, and then remembering our note names. Uh, in fact, it's fairly easy to learn the theory that I'll teach you in the second half, and you'll probably know quite a lot about it. Um, it's also a staple of Western and non-Western music. It seems that tuning gets like a casual mention in history classes but we don't really take the time to listen to the differences between them. And mean tone temperament was really important in the Western tradition. Like, there are all these writings that come close to the 1900s lamenting its loss or praising the fact that we were moving on to equal temperament, like a Mahler. So, you know, that's something, that's something to note. Something to note that people were trying to figure out a tuning solution. Uh, we also sort of act like 12 tone equal temperament has been the solution for many years and always was been definitely isn't true. Uh, it's also an important basis of music theory. Uh, I guess the essence of music theory for a long time has actually been tuning. 
but then PM has sort of abandoned that. And now it's become about what can be done with the PM. Uh, there's also a huge improvement in ear training and musicianship. Uh, when you go in choir and sing or play an instrument and you have intonation issues, being able to hear really small differences really helps. And it also helps to know what you're hearing. Uh, and a microtonal ear will give you that. By microtonal ear, I mean just an ear that's been desensitized to things that aren't 12 tones equal temperament. Because some of those sound like, you know, pretty whack at first, I mean. They sound really weird, but then eventually things get easier to hear. Um, and of course, it's properties for you mindsets. Uh, there are a lot of creative, creative ways to go about building scales and harmonizing those scales, perhaps not even using harmony at all. Uh, there are just a million new things to be discovered, and so few people are talking about this. That's the thing. If you're a microtonalist, you jump on the bandwagon right now, I promise you, you know, you'll get credit almost immediately because there's like nobody in the field. And of course, I don't know if you guys have been to music class, but it's an answer to 20th century desires. Uh, in the 20th century, music got a lot more experimental, and people started abandoning diatonicism and tonality. That thing I showed you with the piano, which is do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And honestly, a lot of the things that composers were saying, like <coughs> Schoenberg, um, Baird, uh, and many of the others of that time period, other famous composers, uh, they essentially want microtonality. They want something that can create new scales, new harmonies, new consonants, new dissonance. But because uh, music theory, tuning had been abandoned, there was sort of not really much of a recourse uh, to go to microtonal things. But it's very odd, because a lot of the composers were actually very keen on knowing this stuff. And like Schoenberg even talks about the 11th partial being F sharp, which by the way, it's not accurate about that. Uh, and you know, uh, Schenker mentions that only overtones, uh, they go up to five, are worth hearing because of their consonants, which I also disagree with and we'll get into. But, I mean, all the composers, weirdly enough, were addressing this tuning situation, but not really trying out microtonal things. Uh, but now, a lot of other composers are. And there were certainly many composers in the 20th century that did try microtonal techniques. It's just that they aren't mentioned in music history. So it looks like nobody was doing that. All righty, common misconceptions I've heard about microtonality. It's just like atonality. Not exactly. Um, this is a very simple uh, difference. Uh, in atonal music, you may have something that doesn't sound like it repeats and comes to a time. Uh, but in microtonality, you could do that. Uh, microtonality even has sounds that are more in tune than our piano, as we've mentioned. So the whole spectrum of in tune to out of tune is explored. Uh, it always sounds out of tune or dissonant. Pretty much what I just said, you got a spectrum there, and you don't have a spectrum with the piano. Although, most people know that. Uh, quarter tones and microtones are the same. I've never heard somebody say that, but if I mention microtonality around some people, they will tend to say, well, I've heard music with quarter tones in it. Mm -hmm. Now, quarter tones are not bad, but they do not sufficiently explain that full spectrum. Uh, and people mm -hmm. have different explanations about that. Music theory makes no sense without 12 notes. Actually, music theory you learn in class tends to be heavily based in diatonicism, so it's actually quite rare to find uh, theory classes about more of the under advanced techniques and other weird stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, music theory has really never made sense. Composers have kind of done their own thing and broken the rules after knowing them, of course. And it is good to take the music theory classes. I wouldn't advocate against that. Most other countries use the 12 note scale, right? Well, that's sort of a mixed question. I've heard that from a lot of people. And what happened was uh, the Western tradition or the Occidental tradition was the only tradition to develop the diatonic scale. And there were many traditions that used math to figure out how to tune their pitch. Like a good example is Indian music theory. The Chinese actually figured out equal temperament much, much before we did. But, you know, uh, a lot of the other countries ended up using uh, scales that were either more simple or more complicated. Uh, like many Japanese traditions used pentatonic scales or notate pitch in their folk music by just drawing a line going up and down. And then, you know, the Indian tradition uses a lot of different intonations that basically play some versions of diatonic scales, but it's not quite in the same ballpark. You'll hear a lot of Eastern music has that drone and the singers are singing above it. They're actually hitting very, very precise notes that we don't have in our tuning system. And a lot of Arabic music is now sort of played with quarter tones, as other countries have tried to quantify our tuning system like the West has. The West has also sort of spread to other countries and enforced 12 tone equal temperament kind of across the world, like they learn it in China now and stuff like that. So, how 
how is a scale created? Well, great question, PowerPoint. So some people, when they create a scale, will pick notes by year and sort of don't play that yet. Uh, how we have this done. Uh, and I mean, this is actually what a lot of modern micrototalists do if they're wanting to use their ears to find something interesting. Something that either defies what they've heard or fits in with it, or is a mix of the two where the ear gets confused. And this was also how like, the gambling tradition was developed. Uh, because people actually uh, hit certain objects and they cause beating within the music, and that's considered a pleasing sound, but Westerners were considered beating dissonant. So there are a lot of different quality standards when you <coughs> notice by ear and copy. Uh, there's also pitch calculation. Uh, as I mentioned, several uh, developed cultures figured out the calculations for pitch. It's often attributed to Pythagoras. You know, he has the famous story about hitting the bronze things with the anvils and noticing how big they were. But that's a little bit uh, full of conjecture. Uh, but anyway, the information is spread around. And there's temperament. Now, after this pitch stuff was figured out, people figured out these fractions representing musical pitches were in tune, which we'll get to. And then they figured out that it was impractical to play it using only the fractions. So temperament was the process of like sort of changing it a little bit so it could be more playable. And from what I understand, it seems to be a Western thing to use temperament, although temperament is certainly mentioned in other cultures. Uh, there's also the idea of adapting to existing instruments. This is true today with the Boston Microtonal Society, which uses 72 tone equal temperament. That's just 12 times 6. Very true of some other composers as well, like Moise Halva. Um, and, oh man, there's another composer. His name is very complicated. I think it's like Wynne Chikradesky. I should have learned how to say that before I came here. But he's also used 12 times and quite a bit because, of course, he can do quite other instruments. Charles Ives is perhaps the most famous for using uh, quarter tones. He hasn't even, uh, he's discovered a quarter tone chord. In fact, and there were amusing stories about how his father used to punish the children by making them sing quarter tones. You know, he's a very experimental person. So that seems to be a common thread that's been more recent. And then uh, William Sotharis actually uses timber-based approaches to generating those kinds of sounds. He actually wrote a big book on how timbre and consonants are related, and even how gamelan music has tuned to its spectrum, the sound spectrum, very intuitively without any math. Is essentially within like five cents error of their, of their spectrum, which is very difficult to believe. That's quite a narrow range. Our semitone is 100 cents, by the way, if you go up one down on the piano. Mm -hmm. But anyway, let's hear what Williams and Thoris came up with. So you see how much effort goes 
into making instruments you think, oh, okay, I guess it is good to be subtle at 12 tone because instruments are hard to make. They are very hard. Uh, the timbre affects the perceived consonants. This is something that Williams and Thoris would argue about, and that piece that we heard was a good demonstration of that. He used something that was very out of tune with 12 tone, but because the timbre was very inharmonic and bright, it didn't sound like it clashed at all, right? Like you guys would agree, it sounded pretty good. Uh, and of course, there are notation issues. Um, we have a standard that we don't want to deviate from, so a lot of microtonalists will take the seven notes that we have, the C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and then just kind of like bastardize them a little bit, depending on the purposes. And of course, electronic instruments have freed up microtonality once and for all, and there's kind of this threshold that's been crossed where now theory can become experiment. If you just have the right synth, it can retune, it can do a little math. All right, so how many notes is the right number of notes? This is a question that I get a lot. Uh, and these are just some examples. I've already discussed a few of them, but most of them come from very specific reasons. Uh, 12 tone equal temperament comes from the diatonic scale and modulation. We want to be able to play in all of the keys the same way. So that's why we have the piano and its equal temperament. Uh, five tone scales uh, exist in many parts of the world, pentatonic scales. The gamelan is essentially a five tone scale, although a lot of those uh, scales that are used in Eastern countries don't use math, so they can tend to be approximated. Uh, African scales are this way. There are a lot of seven tone African scales, and many of them have a pentatonic basis. That means that five notes are treated as diatonic and two is chromatic. Sort of like on our piano, <coughs> seven is diatonic and five is chromatic. Um, and Joseph Yasser actually has a big book on that, which you should read. He can ask me about that at the show. But anyway, uh, moving on to 53 tone. 53, that sure is a lot. Well, the truth is, 53 is very good at approximating diatonic harmony, but it's a lot of notes. Uh, the Turkish tradition uses it because they play something called Makam music. And Makam music had been around for a long time. And you know, the music sort of gets passed on from person to person. There's an oral tradition. And because of that, uh, eventually when the West sort of came over and started influencing them, they had to quantify it somehow. So then they decided that their music functioned as a subset of 53 EDO. So probably their music isn't going to be wildly dissonant and exploratory with serialism and the like, like our music has been. But they simply use it to classify what they've been doing all this time. And there are a lot of been a lot of efforts to do that in Macomb music, especially. Um, 72 tone equal used by the Boston Microtonal Society. Of course, it is a 12 times N. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, EDO apparently is an abbreviation for. Yes, I'm very glad you asked about that. I tried to weed that out of most of the slides, but it appears that I missed one. Let me explain it briefly. EDO just means equal division of the octave. So the okay. thing that I explained earlier with the piano and the octaves, how you hear the same distance, right. that would apply to any number with, you know, N with an EDO after it. And like one EDO would just be the octave, you know, and two EDO would just be our tritone, three EDO would be our diminished chord. Don't know how much music here you guys know. But yeah, that's all EDO means. I'm very glad you asked. And by the way, if any of you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, I love questions. Uh, in fact, we even have several people but anyway, moving on, 205. Now that is a really big number. This is uh, Aaron Hunt's number for estimating the full pitch spectrum. And he actually designed and programmed a really, really cool instrument and a notation system that he uses to play it. But unfortunately, he hasn't written any music <coughs> with it. Uh, there is another person, Dolores Catherino, who writes music with it regularly. And they actually met very recently uh, about a TED Talk and such. But yeah, that's sort of his uh, estimation. You know, if you get so fine in the pitch discrimination, we can only hear about like a five cent difference. So then Aaron Hunt's piano essentially has, well, it's more like a clavichord and it's electronic. But anyway, the steps of that are really just about that the whole way. Uh, so now we'll take a look at the tonal plexus. This is Aaron's keyboard. Free promotion, Aaron, just for you, because your keyboard's so great. I hope you watch this. But yeah, anyway, here it is. It's a great thing. This is something that hybridizes what we know with microtonality. So look at that. That looks just like a piano. So without knowing anything about tuning whatsoever, you can figure out, 
oh, okay, I kind of know where my hand's going to want to do. Although, as Aaron has mentioned on numerous occasions, the technique is more like a clavichord and not a piano, because the buttons are very small and plastic. You can't, like, you can't really want it. You've got to be very precise and sort of delicate and over the keys a little bit more. So now let's hear the piece that Dolores, one of the pieces that Dolores has made for the tonal plexus. know that it is a recent experiment that has sort of been undertaken by these ideas. 
So what's the key to successful promotion? As you can see, most of the attempts at notation especially are attempts to bring the general public to an awareness of this and to give, you know, to make it as easy as possible so they can all learn it. So to shorten the gap, these are my beliefs on the subject. We need unity on one idea. Uh, the common standard, 12th unequal temperament, has held us together for such a long time, and it's because we all agree on it and use it. If all microtonalists were to back another idea just as aggressively, there might be more change, although I'm not really sure about that. It seems that many favor 22 tone equal, uh, but I have a special choice which I'll mention after this slide. Uh, it seems that everybody is doing their own thing, and so it'll you know, be forever relegated like a nerdy offshoot in academia if we don't all back something. Uh, then, of course, there's the notation, which I already mentioned, the C, D, E, F, G, A, B. That really helps. Uh, producing real instruments. I think this gets people more interested. Uh, there's been a lot of proof of this. Computers are great, but not a lot of people want to learn how to retune stuff or even what that means. If they have a real instrument that they can play, there's less that they have to figure out. And, of course, there should be a smallish number of notes. I'm sure 53 EDO terrifies even the new So we need to make it as close to 12 tone as possible. That's what all of these things add up to. This is why my idea is going to be equal temperament with 19 tones. Because 19 can still play the diatonic scale. It's the next smallest equal temperament that can do that. And it's very, very learnable. You can notate it in exactly the same way. And some of the anharmonic shock, in fact, you could just take like a piece of Mozart music and sit down and play it in 19 tone, and it would sound about the same. So here, let's listen to the 19 tone scale and how great it sounds. First, we'll do the chromatic scale. There's a 
lot to cover in a short amount of time, so most of what I'll be going over is sort of the basics, the mechanics, and then what's happened in the Western tradition, and then what people are kind of doing now. So first, let's listen to another little teaser of music. This first song is something I created um, imitating a mad professor who's obsessed with microtonality. <laughs> So there we go, another teaser for you. So, let's talk about the mathematics of pitch. Now, when you are measuring pitch, you're actually measuring two notes. So you know, on the piano, if we say, hey, that interval is in major third, we're actually naming two notes from C to E, or any of its transpositions. You could also name a major third as D flat to F, or E to G sharp, or G sharp to B sharp, or A flat to C. There are a lot of ways to name major thirds. So it may not refer to letters, it will refer to a certain distance between two points. Uh, and this is actually how decibels work as well. If you say something is 60 decibels loud, it's assumed that there is a threshold of hearing that you're comparing it to. And also like decibels, measuring pitch is a logarithmic endeavor. That is, if you use a number to describe the physical thing that's changing in the pitch world, you will perceive it out of whack. You'll perceive it logarithmically. So this is why we use sense and ratios. Now sense, uh, we use addition and subtraction for those. A logarithm converts between sense and ratios. So on the piano, again, if we have 100 cents in between each note, then that means you can just say, like, if I go one third of a 12 tone note up, I have 33.3 repeating cents, et cetera. And that makes sense uh -huh, to me. And it applies to all frequency ranges. Uh, ratios are used for frequencies. You know, if I have a frequency vibrating at 100 hertz, which is about a G, and I go up by 100 hertz, I'll have 200 hertz. And if I go down by 100 hertz, I would have zero hertz. So there's this uh, disconnect where the intervals aren't the same if you add and subtract frequencies. You can't do that. You can add and subtract cents. That's basically it. Everything else is going to require a multiplication or a division. And that is where we use ratios. Ratios are also written in their fractional form to correspond to consonants and or character. So uh, the examples of how to use sense and ratios, uh, of course, we talked about the piano using 100 cents. Well, let's use one example of a ratio. Let's say we had a guitar, and we were trying to figure out Pythagorean tuning on a guitar. These ratios, as you can see, they're not referring to uh, you know, something that you can add and subtract. They're multiplications of distances. And you actually need to invert those kinds of things when you're talking about distances. Like, for example, this, nine, this uh, 8 over 9 here, you normally write that in Pythagorean tuning as a 9 over 8. Uh, it actually works backwards from frequency. So if I have a frequency at 100 hertz, if I multiply it by 9 over 8, which is the, the fraction for a major second, I get a major second higher. But if I have something like a length of pipe, 
for a guitar, I actually need to take eight ninths of that to get a major second higher. You see how they work inversely, but they still both operate using ratios. So now we're moving on to just intervals. The reason that we write ratios in fractional form is to understand just intonation. And essentially the principle is, the simpler the ratio, the more consonant the sound. Um, there are exceptions to that, but generally the numerology has held up really well, and there's definitely a perceptible difference when you invoke it, and you can hear just intonation, like this is not really a debatable thing at this point. Uh, so when a just interval is written as a fraction, of course, you get to see the content of the interval, and it's very striking, the relationship. Uh, to get an inversion of a just interval, you multiply its reciprocal by two. So for example, if I had three over two as a fraction, that roughly corresponds to a perfect fifth. It's like C to G on a piano. If I want to invert that to F, I multiply it by two. So now mm, I've got six over two, and then, well actually, no, sorry, I would multiply the reciprocal by two. I would multiply two over three by two, and then I would get four over three. And that is exactly the perfect fourth. In fact, the tonality diamonds, uh, which you won't see here, but you may see later if you're still interested, uh, actually sort of, you can see the inversions go from one into the other. And of course, just intervals are always in between one and two. This means that they're within the octave. So basic rundown of the frequencies. Uh, since simpler frequencies are more in tune, that actually corresponds to most of what we know about music theory. Uh, using one only would net you the exact same note. Any frequency multiplied by itself or one would just be the same note. Uh, any powers of two at all will yield octaves. So multiplying that note by two to the n, you know, in any direction will just yield octaves. And then three ends up being perfect fifths or stacks of perfect fifths. Uh, those only end up being three over two and four over three. And then the five limit is what we evolved to. That's why I'm using the term limit. I'm referring to the lowest prime numbers that are within the fraction. And that is very important for music theory uh, because people will reference those a lot. Uh, and of course, they'll always be referencing within the octave, although you can certainly write fractions out of the octave, of course, and they'll be valid. It's just that most people prefer to study it within the octave. Uh, so then of course, uh, the end limit is usually compared to the overtone series, which you've seen in class. Uh, you'll start with C, and then there will be G for two, uh, well, actually, C for two, sorry, because two is not good. Right. If we're starting in C. And then three would be G, or three over one, which can be reduced, of course, to three over two. Four over one yields yet another octave, C. And then E is our five over one. But the E that occurs in the overtone series is about 15 cents flat of the one we use in equal temperament. And then, of course, there's another G for six over one. And then seven over one yields something very interesting. It yields like a minor seventh that's flat by about 33 cents. And we can call that a septimal interval. And microtonalists actually use those prefixes to talk about which intervals are which. So if you hear somebody say it's a septimal interval or it's an undecimal interval, septimal refers to seven, undecimal refers to 11. And many uh, microtonalists are fond of studying higher limits. I content myself with 11 and under, like Harry Parch, but that might change in the future. So that's all that limit means. Are we clear on that, everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So now let's talk about the sensation of consonants. Dakota, you are ready, but do not click yet. So essentially, when you have something that is a consonant sound, it will lock into place and you won't hear any beating. This is according to the Western term we discussed in Gamblin, which has beats in it. That would not be considered Western consonants. But the actual physical sensation of beats disappearing is something objective you can hear in the sound. So when I say there's an objective sensation of consonants happening in the notes and you can hear it, I'm not talking about how good it sounds. That's up to you to determine. I'm talking about how still the sound is and how agitated it is. And once you get a microtonal ear, which again, just means being desensitized to 12th and equal temperament, you'll start to hear this a lot more in timbres and truly understand which things are more consonant and dissonant. When Dakota plays this file, we will hear, Pythagorean fifths being stacked, these are pure fifths. Our 12th and equal tempered fifths are very close. We'll also hear Pythagorean diatonic chords, which will sound dissonant due to the thirds, and then a just version where they sound much more constant. So go ahead, Dakota, take it away. Oh, wrong one.
So you can hear all that craziness in the sound. It just goes away with the rest of the So this here, it does actually have to do with the previous thing, I promise. Uh, you know, when we had the Pythagorean fifths, what happened was we were just moving up by perfect fifths and then tuning those, and we just kept going. And I can even go off of here. But then what happens is, eventually, we want to sort of get back where we started and use these notes. When you get far enough off, you encounter wolves, um, which are the nicknames for intervals that beat and sound badly out of tune. The bad thing out of tune fifth occurred because we went all the way to G sharp and then tried to go to E flat here. And so that doesn't sound very good. Pythagorean tuning is a three limit system. It starts here at the unity of the tonic. And it continues in both directions only using the perfect fifth. But then when you add five, you can also get these notes here, which were a Western development. And then eventually the West started accepting the five limit as consonant. So we would call this uh, a lattice that uses five and three that's two-dimensional. You can also have a three-dimensional five limit lattice if you put the octave in it, but this is octave reduced. So all of the ratios in this lattice are just intervals. Now, as you can see, when we multiply these, uh, you might think to yourself, well, maybe if we get far enough out here, we'll get one of the notes over here. Turns out that doesn't happen. And that's because it would have to be an octave reduction of one of these other notes. If you take three to the A power and then try and equal it to two to the B power, A and B will never be the same. Which is why, in just intonation, we have an infinite number of notes to choose from. Uh, usually we choose the ones that are in tune, but this is a problem when we have to tune other notes. Like see this uh, major third here, C to E, he uses the five over four. If I'm gonna get that in tune in like A major, well, first of all, I've got a few A's to choose from. I've got this Pythagorean A, or this A that's tuned from F major. The A from F major is probably more in tune, right? So then if I want a major third there, I have to tune this. Um, it turns out that these other notes like D flat, you know, which we normally figure is C sharp, those kinds of notes, and like this note, they don't work so well. Uh, in fact, this note is only used with this A. So this is where the idea of temperament comes in. Me. Oh, well, we already talked about whether just intonation was actually perfect consonants or not. Not always, but you can definitely hear it. So, because it's not always perfect consonants, temperament is actually an acceptable way to sort of ruin it. Because if something is close enough to just intonation, it will pretty much be there, or sound close enough to be there to be okay in the average year. In fact, really conditioning is all the, the only thing you need because we have 12 tone equal temperament and our thirds are quite bad or our fifths are good. And I'll explain that closer to the end. So using ratios to build a tuning was what I described in the last. Pythagorean only uses perfect fifths, so we call it three limit. Uh, the diatonic scale uses the five limit, so it's called just intonation, by using ratios with five and such. Um, and then we compromise more and more as we blow on. Essentially, you see the spectrum where we discovered consonants, we discovered a slightly more advanced consonants, we worked on trying to get it in tune, and then we compromised it more and more to play in more keys until harmonic purity in the thirds essentially went away and we almost became Pythagorean again, uh, but our fifths are very good. In fact, the fifths in equal temperament are better than the ones in mean tone temperament. So let's talk about Pythagorean tuning. We multiply by the perfect fifth, and then you know we've got one over one, three over two, and we just keep multiplying by three over two. But of course, that's not an octave, so since it's not a just interval, we reduce it, we multiply it, or actually multiply by one half to get nine over eight, and we can just continue stacking these fifths. Also, not an octave. Twenty-seven over sixteen times three over two is that. Multiply it by one half, so then we just keep stacking the same interval and we get the scale. Um, and, oh, I forgot something, F. Turns out that if we go the other way, of course, on the lattice, uh, we're actually dividing by a perfect fifth, which is also, consequently, multiplying by a perfect fourth. These are the inversions that you learned about in class. So now, this is all here. But, with the just scale, the third sound we're in tune, and the fifths are in tune, 
So it seems like there's no reason to not eat just the nation. Uh, so that Dakota, if you could click that, we'll hear what these justly tuned chords sound like, which we did before. sound like. And I don't know if you remember your triads, but see, look, here are the triads that we have from music theory. We've got C, E, and G, and the just intervals between them correspond to ratios we know about. The just major third and the just minor third. So, when we have one, four, and five, which are the main triads that are used in Western music, it turns out that tuning all of the thirds pure leads to this. And so this is how we get actually every single pitch. C, E, and G, F, A, C, and G, B, and E. That is all the pitches of the diatonic scale. There's Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do. So there is absolutely everything. So we come back to the diatonic scale. But then there's a problem that we have in just intonation. If your math is savvy, which I don't know how savvy it is, you might notice that F to A, of course, is a major third because we tuned it that way. And most of these other notes are perfect fifths. You know, C to G is a perfect fifth. E to B is actually a perfect fifth too, but D to A is not. In fact, it's a wolf, a wolf fifth. So we can't have that because then if we tried to play D minor, we would get something awful sounding. So then what uh, the Westerners did was they added a second, second hop, and it was slightly flatter. Now, 10 over 9 harmonizes just great with F and A here, but 9 over 8 only harmonizes with G and B. So we've got two different rules for D, and it depends on the harmony, because again, in Western music, we want constant triads, right, at this point in time. This is where temperament steps in. What temperament does is it gets rid of a small distance between two notes that are very close. This is called banishing the comma, a banishing comma, or tempering the comma out. And 81 over 80 is the comma that we use in mean tone temperament, or that we used in that time period. So several of the interval distinctions are obliterated and become one interval. This is telling us right here that the small d and the large d, the ones for G and D minor, they're both now represented by the same d, and we don't have to distinguish them. And then this next one, this is the major third, see here, and this, I don't know if you remember, this is the Pythagorean E that we got from stacking a few fifths. This is now telling us that a stack of five perfect fifths is equal to a major third, and those are the same thing now. And then this is telling us that a Pythagorean minor third is also now a minor third. If you remember, Pythagorean thirds are considered dissonant because they're not simple ratios, they're very complicated, so you can't quite hear them as a concordance that locks in in the way those just chords locked in. But now that the differences are eliminated, let's look and see what happens when temperament actually occurs. Um, well, what happens is we start compromising between three and five. Uh, you see 10 here has a five in it, when you think about it. Five times two is 10 on the top, right? Nine between the threes. And then nine over eight is the three really interval. So, it seems that all of these intervals here are actually three limit or Pythagorean. And all of these intervals here are five limit. So we are making a compromise between Pythagorean and the new five limit system when we introduce the mean tone. So with mean tone, we still use two generators. Now the generator is simply the thing that we stack over and over again for animals. You remember in Pythagorean tuning, of course, when we stack C, G, D, A, etc., the perfect fifth was acting as the generator. But you could also say that's a rank to temperament. And talking about ranks is a great way to reference temperament nowadays. It refers to how many generators you have, as well as the dimensionality of the tuning. The reason in Pythagorean has two generators is because the octave counts. So in Pythagorean, you're only using the numbers two and three to generate all the notes. You're not using any other ones. But equal temperament is ranked one. And this is because when we use the smallest step of any equal temperament to generate the whole set of notes, we get the octave again. And so we don't have to use 
an octave, you know, to generate ordos that we didn't have. The reason we have to use the octave in Pythagorean and in mean tone is because Pythagorean and mean tone don't close at the octave and they don't create a closed system. But equal temperaments do, and that's why they're rank one. So mean tone being rank two has two generators like Pythagorean. Five limit just intonation has three generators. It has uh, five limit ratios, or ratios with five, and then ratios with three, and then ratios with two. In fact, the prime numbers actually play a huge role in this dimensionality thing. Each prime number is considered its own dimension. So based on however many prime numbers you had, you'd be able to specify the dimensionality of the tuning system if it was in just intonation. Let's say I had 11 limit just intonation. Then I would have two, three, five, seven, and 11. Those are my prime numbers. So I have a five dimensional tuning system of just intonation if I use the 11 limit. If I had the seven limit, I would have four. The five limit, as we know, is three. And of course, Pythagorean and many others are two. Right? Two temperaments are actually the most popular to talk about nowadays because it's fairly easy to specify how a tuning system is constructed using just its generator and its period. And the period is just another name for the generator that acts as the octave, almost always. <coughs> Excuse me. There are a few rank two temperaments that have non-octave periods, but they're very rare and we're not going to talk about them because this is a lot of information. So, and when you have you know, a prime, uh, a system with prime numbers and you have an end limit system and a certain dimensionality, for every comma you temper out, the dimensionality is reduced by one. See, do you remember how we had just intonation and we tempered out the syntonic comma? Five limit just intonation is you know, rank three, and when we get rid of the syntonic comma, there goes one comma, now we've got a rank two system, mean tone. And it turns out this works for other kinds of temperaments that aren't mean tone. Uh, most of the temperaments that were discussed in the Western idiom were ways to solve the diatonic problem. But now temperament has been modernized and it's become uh, something where you can take any number and temper out anything. Like what if I wanted E and F to be the same in five of adjusted intonation, be represented by the same note? Then I could use father temperament and get rid of the diatonic semitone, 16 over 15. This is sort of the way that people are thinking nowadays and they're finding these new novel temperaments to use. And, of course, when we specify mean tone, we're going to be using sense. We use fractions to talk about just intervals, but otherwise, sense are much more convenient because it's easier to visualize the distances. So then, the paper that talks about this is called a middle path. I don't know if the camera can see this board right now, but this hexagonal graph is essentially sort of a culmination of a lot of microtonal theory. And, as you can see, there's a mean tone line here. So I'm gonna use the diatonic scale to kind of explain how this works. Each of the green lines refers to a temperament, and then each temperament is assigned a generator of a certain size. Some of them have altered fists and some of them don't, but mean tone is the most prevalent one that uses a fit. And then as the generator changes sizes, uh, different things start to happen, because when you stack a perfect fit, if you stack an altered perfect fit at a certain size, you can actually end up closing the octave and creating an equal temperament. Think about what would happen if we stacked a perfect fit that was close to three over two with a size of 700 cents. We know that 700, you know, if we stack it enough times, we've got something that locks in with 100 cents, so we would eventually get 12 tone equal temperament. And this spectrum simply illustrates that in other equal temperaments. If I stack a mean tone generator with a flatter fit, I get 19. In fact, you can use this mean tone spectrum to sort of get the general idea of how all of this tuning has gone. Pythagorean is pretty much like here, you know, and then mean tone slips down this way, and then this is where we are now with 12 tone equal temperament. So that's sort of a little bit about how this graph works. We'll also have a demonstration at the end where I play with the perfect fit and show you the changing spectrum. The center of this graph is five limit just intonation, and the six sides simply refer to different combinations of three, five, and two, the three different combinations in their intervals. So for example, if I have a perfect fourth here, and this green line is going down, I know that as I go this way on the mean tone line, my perfect fourth is going to get flatter and flatter, and the inverse will happen. The perfect fifth, well, just kidding, let's reverse that. The perfect fifth will get flatter and the perfect fourth will get sharper, my bad. 
but you understand it's a continuum. Uh, so then rank two temperaments are usually notated this way. Uh, they're notated with the name of the temperament and the little bracket. So mean times seven refers to the diatonic scale because we generate seven fifths, right? We get the whole diatonic scale, C, G, D, A, E, B. And if I just used another temperament, I might use different names for the notes or something that's not even a fit altogether, and I could change its size and see what would happen. So the Maximus P example will be at the end due to continuity. So now let's talk about circle-based approaches because we have this spectrum here, but it still might be a little bit difficult to understand. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the circle of fifths and then talk about how important it is in terms of mean tone. Um, if I've got C, G, D, A, E, and then F, oh, that's my whole diatonic scale. So if I keep going, if I wanted B flat and B to be the same note, I could have drawn it a little bit farther out and then tempered out the comma. Mm -hmm. And then you would have, oh, I believe it's, uh, oh, Whitewood. That's actually not a graph, but I know it. Uh, but what you want to do is actually keep going, right? So in class, they teach you that this is the circle of fists, and then this is the end. But our inharmonics are only shared because we decided to use 12 tone equal. If you wanted to use F sharp, but not temper out the difference between F sharp and G flat, you would have something else, and you could keep going. And these notes wouldn't have to be the same. They could be slightly off depending on the size of the generator. But what 12 tone equal temperament and other equal temperaments do is they say, all right, we're gonna make F sharp and G flat the same. So now, all of the notes can just play within the same system. And we don't have to keep adding new notes and new generators. That's what 12 tone equal temperament does. And if you generalize this to 19 and keep going, what you can actually do is you can go around here and draw like, you know, D flat, G flat, um, and then let's see, F sharp, C sharp, uh, G sharp, D sharp, and then eventually when you get to B sharp, G flat goes to C flat, and C flat and B sharp are the same note in 19. So you see we're simply adding more of kind of the same thing to get a closed system. So this is one way to use a circle. Now this circle simply has the generator circling around, but it doesn't really take the octave into account. It just goes back to this note. The other way that people use circles in music theory is to describe an octave and sort of fractionally show how far around an octave is. In post-tonal set theory, this is called a clock face. And a clock face only uses 12 notes. You simply draw a circle, and then at the top is zero, and you just go around for each of the 12 notes. But if you do that with a circle, that is meant to represent the octave that hasn't been segmented into 12 tone equal temperament, you get something that goes around at 1200 cents, and you can draw in generators and they don't have to close up the octave. Uh, this popular shape, uh, which is sort of uh, you know, pioneered by Irv Wilson, is known as a horogram. And horograms get a bit of scant explanation online, but if you want to know how to use it and have an iPad, you should download Wilsonic. That's the name of the app that does this. But here's how we draw a program. So this part up here, this is going to represent 1,200 cents. It's going to represent our octave. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw rings. And then with mean tone, I'll have the size of the fifth in there. And you can see how a perfect fifth that doesn't close up the octave will stack. Uh, I'm actually, sorry, I'm actually stacking a perfect fourth. And what I'll be doing is coming around from the right and just repeatedly adding 504 cents, 504 cents, 504 cents, approximately. And it's never quite going to close. So there's our octave. We've got one note, okay. And then we'll draw another ring, and we'll have two notes. There we go, so that's our 504 cent, approximately, interval. Now, what I'm gonna keep doing is when I draw concentric rings, there will be some arrangements that don't have two step sizes, and I will leave those out. This is tradition in the horogram because Irv Wilson was interested in studying scales that had only two step sizes. So this one is considered a small step, and this one is considered a large step. 
So we're going to draw three. Oh good, we still got small, large, large. There's three. And then I'm going to draw four. But it seems that we have an inequality. We have two small steps here, and then we have a middle step and a large step. So that is not going to work in our program. We're going to skip four, but we're not going to draw a four ring. We're going to continue on and draw five. And lo and behold, we have two large steps and three small steps. So that gives us five. Now we'll draw six. Still not quite there. See, got a small step and then some other step sizes here. And seven, and that works. That's mean tone seven, our diatonic scale. And then if we keep going, we draw eight. You see how these are cycling around? Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Now we have mean tone 12. This is our chromatic scale. But notice how in the foreground, when we use a different generator, the chromatic scale is unequal. We've got a small semitone and a large one. So this is just what happens when you don't make it close with the octave. Then we continue. One more, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Lo and behold, we have 19 tones. And that's still not 19 tone equal. You can see that there are still two step sizes. There's the small one. There's a large one. There's another large and another large. I did draw this by hand, so they're not perfect. Unfortunately, this is a large image. You can kind of see that. But you also get the idea that it will create these recurring large, small patterns. And that is how the horogram is drawn. Coincidentally, it also seems that these numbers here act as equal temperaments that temper out whatever comma the horogram is referring to. So if mean tone is referring to the syntonic comma, well, look at that. That means that 5, 7, 12, 19, et cetera, those will all temper out the syntonic comma. And it turns out the sequence of numbers goes 31, 50, and then a few other large ones. But this works, again, for other temperaments as well. Horograms are sometimes drawn in different ways. Uh, in Paul's paper, when he draws this first one, see, he actually goes out from the left and then alternately goes out the other way. This is harder to keep track of because you have to figure out what's alternating, but it allows you to see the moment of symmetry, the symmetry in between the scales. You can see that at the middle, they map onto themselves and you can simply flip it over sideways. So that is a very interesting connection between temperament and horograms that is explored a lot more fully in Paul's paper. And of course, each of these horograms will actually correspond to one of these green lines on the graph. All right, that is essentially the end. We can move on to the demonstration very quickly. Uh, let me just pull something up really fast, and then we can talk about it. So what I have is a file in Max MSP. I don't know how well you can see this, Dakota. Can you see the screen? Feel free to gather around. I'll try to be out of the way for part of it and then explain it. So. Do I need to be out of the way of this for you? Oh no, everybody's seen that already. Okay. That's done with. Okay, so what we have here is a major scale. And I can play chords with it. And I can change the size of the fifth. This max patch refers directly to the generator of mean tone or its you know, relatives. Because 12 EO is considered a mean tone. You can describe these equal temperaments by saying that they're mean tones. And then it has them ordered in ascending order. So if I drag the fifth around, you can hear the major chord change in quality. And since we have to compromise between our third and our fifth, what happens is, as we drag the generator up and down, things happen. The whole steps all get larger, and the half steps all get smaller when the fifth gets sharper. And the inverse happens when the fifth gets flatter. So when the fifth gets as flat as a mean tone can get, what happens is, it ends up being seven tone equal temperament, which is not a mean tone that's very in tune. So that's equally divided.
divided into seven parts across the octave. This is 19 tone, which functions as a very good mean tone, and the minor third is almost exactly pure by coincidence. Hear how there's no beating? Then with quarter comma mean tone, major chord also sounds really good. Our major third sounds quite good there. Nearly you know, just. The 19 one is a little bit flatter. As we know, because as the fifth gets flatter, so does the major third. So this is essentially uh, the end of the presentation at this point. I invite you to come play with the spectrum and drag around and see how the spectrum changes. See, Pythagorean is a little bit sharper. The pure fifth is about 702 cents. So the thirds are dissonant. And then when we go down to 12, just a little bit more acceptable. This is why 12 is considered Pythagorean, because the fifths are very close to the same size. So that gives us a fifth that's close to in tune, but the thirds, not so good. That concludes my presentation on microtonal music theory.